was all about, he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that to this end, with this goal in mind, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Familiar enough, I think, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God, is from now on, that is since the death and resurrection of Jesus, this very dark world's one source of light. And Jesus says, use this as it is intended to be used. We would not have put all of these new lights in, then turn them on, and then put dark sheets over them so that their light would be ineffective in the building. That's absurd. Jesus says, in the same way, you are the light, but don't hide it because the world has no other source of light than you who are my kingdom. But as it is with many Christian teachings, it has undergone a transformation over time. For instance, consider that popular children's gospel song, this little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it, it's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. All up in my house, I'm gonna let it shine. Out there in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Now there's not a first person plural pronoun anywhere in the song. We, us, our light. Now don't worry, I'm not going to be a Grinch about this. It is just a children's song, and so we're not going to purge it from every church uh, or children's program that we might have. I'm only citing it as an illustration, because over time, our default Christian witness has become the I, and not the we. But in the New Testament, apart from those individuals who are uniquely appointed to preach the gospel, I would say the emphasis is reversed. The focus is on the we, and even the personal interactions that may occur are interactions with an individual in connection with the larger congregation. And so it is, you are the light, not you are the lights of the world. And of course, the way to read this passage is easily confirmed by the other part of the passage. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. A city, by definition, is a collective. It is made up of citizens who together enjoy the rights and privileges that the city bestows on those who live and work and cooperate together in the city for its welfare. And of course, there is nothing in the passage that requires that the good works that outsiders see be good works that are done in service to outsiders. That's fine, but the passage doesn't say that. It can include those works done to outsiders, but the good works can occur within the body of believers itself. So the good works can just as easily be the expressions of love 
and forms of service that the city's citizens offer to each other. And if you look at the commandments that follow in the Sermon on the Mount, they are often related to the way we interact with one another in the church. Our first Thessalonians passage, which is just one among many similar passages in the New Testament, is just an updated version of this very same kingdom. A city within a larger city, which at one and the same time is a bright light in the city's darkness. And so the purpose really of this sub-series is to bring out our hidden city, as far as, that is, as it is hidden, to bring it out into the open and to remove the basket that covers our light so that the Gentiles, among whom we've been strategically planted, may see our good works and thus give glory to our Heavenly Father. And this morning, my focus is going to be on Jesus' city as the place where human sexuality's original creational boundaries are restored. Well, let me say that again. Jesus' city is the place, the location, where human sexuality's original creational boundaries are restored, thus offering the world's citizens a new way to be authentically sexual. It's a new old way, but from their perspective, a new way to be authentically sexual. That brings me to my first point this morning. The Gentile city We'll make it generic Gentile city. The Gentile city is a city of sexual anarchy. The Gentile city is a city of sectional of sexual anarchy. Now, in my younger years as a Christian, before I was actually in a pulpit, this was the place in the sermon where the preacher began to cite all the scary sexual statistics. He'd then rail against the usual suspects who foisted this lifestyle upon our country. And then he would call on the church to actively oppose, politically and otherwise, all the sexual anarchy going on around us. And some of those statistics can be quite scary. Abortions, sexually transmitted diseases, various public health issues related to sexual immorality, crimes like human trafficking and prostitution, explosive numbers of out-of-wedlock births, all kinds of sexual abuse, even sexual abuse of children, I think the statistic that I've read on that, if we're citing statistics, is one in four children will have some experience of sexual abuse while growing up. Sexual immorality breaks families up and it breaks hearts. In fact, I remember having a conversation with the woman who was our, our hostess, maybe you just say host now, of the Bible study in Kansas City for five years. And like so many people in the Western world, she really couldn't see anything wrong with sex outside of biblical marriage. Now, it may surprise you to hear that if, if, if I were out from under the reign of Christ over his city, I might see it the same way for reasons I may touch on later on in the series. In other words, monogamous lifelong marriage is a spiritual value. It's a religious value. But before you pull out your daggers, 
I'll also say that because I am under the reign of Christ in his city, I challenged her to think it through even from her own worldly point of view, apart from the will of God. Just try to look at it plainly as it is, maybe in terms of all of those scary statistics. How much pain, how much human pain and suffering is there in our world as a result of sexual immorality? We can calculate it in dollars, I suppose, but more basic than things like dollars is just the real human pain that goes from generation to generation, from trauma, from the anxiety that trauma produces, from confusion about what love and sex are, are they interchangeable? Just ask any counselor, just ask any pastor who's had any experience in the church when they are in a counseling situation, how often some sexual experience from the past is playing on the troubles that they are experiencing in the moment. Sexual immorality, of course, benefits from good publicity, or we might even call it propaganda, because in our culture, wherever it is portrayed in, in the media, in all its forms, it's always seen as exciting and fulfilling, a matter of finding purpose and value in the world. But its ruinous effects, the actual toll it takes on people, especially women, but all people, tends to be covered up, shrouded in that darkness. <laughs> So there is plenty of deception about sexuality out there. But despite all its dangers, from an unbeliever's point of view, it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. It is far better to take a chance on sex and love, love and sex, with the dangers included, than to miss out completely. In short, this is not a matter of human reason, ultimately. It is a matter of human passion and the desperate desire that unbelievers have to feel good, to feel something, even if in the long run, it is against their best interests. And I'd say that Paul takes this for granted. I think Paul takes this for granted because it is what his own theology would lead him to believe. As from Sunday School, once more, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Gentiles, I'm paraphrasing a little bit to make it third person, Gentiles are dead in the trespasses and sins in which they walk now, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. They live in the passions of their flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Now, there are any number of passages like this one where the sexual immorality of the Gentile world is seen as the fruit, the bad fruit, of the original sin in the garden and the demonic control that that brought upon the human race. It's an enslaving force. It's a malevolent force. And it's a force that does not submit itself to reason. How can it? How can it? Gentiles, Paul says, are darkened 
in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now by recognizing this, I'm not giving up or giving in to modern cultural forces. I'm just following Paul's theology, which he traces back not to the rise of Greece or to the rise of Rome, but to creation itself. Because when you read Paul in Romans 1, the two immediate sins that dominate the Gentile world are the two sins that dominated the Gentile world. That is, idolatry and sexual immorality, which often go hand in hand. Do you remember when um, Balak asked Balaam to curse the Israelites and he, he couldn't do it? He had some type of gift from God, but he could not use it to curse God's people. And so, unable to affect this sort of mysterious spiritual force on the Israelites in service to Balak, what do they do? They call the girls. Bring on the women. And the Moabite women, I believe they're Moabites, they come into the Israelite camp. They bring with them their gods and their idols. And before you know it, the entire male population of Israel is polluted with sexual immorality. This is a force in the world, and idolatry and sexual immorality go hand in hand, just as the creation account would lead us to believe. Because if you turn away from the one God to the many gods, then you are going to turn away from the one spouse to the who knows how many partners. So, people of God, your clear-headedness about human sexuality, the way you think rightly about it, it's not a conclusion that you reached after a long period of study and reflection. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that enlightened your minds or it enlightened the minds of your parents or grandparents. But somewhere in the line, this knowledge that God is the Creator and the Redeemer who's made Himself known in Jesus Christ changed everything about you. But you're not entitled to take credit for your clear thinking. It is a gift of God, a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a passage from Paul that I don't think gets the attention it deserves because if it did, the church would think twice about being the world's moral police. He's writing to the Corinthians and the context is that despicable sin that the church is tolerating, some are even kind of proud of it, where a man has his father's wife. But drop down to verse 9 in chapter 5. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Uh -huh. Well, of course he did. We're not that type, thank you very much. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. You'd have to build a spaceship and break through the atmosphere to get away from sexual immorality. It's defining for the world. So he clears the, the air. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, 
not even to eat with such a one. And here's the climactic moment. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not those, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? There are all sorts of organizations and churches that should put that as a banner in their headquarters. What have I to do with judging outsiders? They are simply being who they are in their spiritual, their demonic captivity. Paul was not a culture warrior. He was not a moral crusader. He was not a charter member of the Society for the Suppression of Vice, which was a real organization in England. And it had a, another organization in New York called the Society for the Suppression of Vice in New York. That was late in the 19th century. Paul was none of these things. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. And his mission was not to scold Gentiles for being Gentiles or to complain about them by carrying on and on about how sinful lifestyles are ruining things for the rest of us. In fact, here is his mission as it came to him from our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 26, 16-18. But rise, Jesus said to him, and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen, seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Why am I sending you to them? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul, open their blind eyes. Paul, Turn them from the darkness to the light of my kingdom. Paul, release them from Satan's grip. Extend to them in my name the forgiveness of sins, including all sorts of sexual sins that Paul might refer to here and there in his letters. And Paul, offer them a place in my city. I'm going to stop there and return to our Atticus Finch saying, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. So let's walk around in a modern unbeliever's skin for a while and take a look at the city of light. And that's my second point this morning. Jesus' city redeems human sexuality. Jesus' city redeems human sexuality. When you look at Christianity, defined obviously in different ways by different observers, but I'm talking about the church in our culture, Protestant or Catholic or Protestant and Catholic. And you think about its message on marriage and sexuality. What is it that you see and hear? <coughs> and by message here, I mean its overall message, not when it just repeats the Bible's teaching. But how the church institutionally conveys that to the wider world 
in both its words and in its practice. And now, as a thought experiment, take off your Christian glasses and put on, if you can, Gentile glasses and look again. I'm going to let you do that for a minute. When I do it, and I remember being a Gentile, my arrow tends to the cynical side of the dial. So I tend to see a garbled and inconsistent church. I see moralism, I see plenty of self-righteousness, and I see lots of moral failure. And it, it's sort of interesting over the decades that when major evangelical leaders, for example, fall, that the church's message suddenly turns to grace and restoration, even if the, the individual who fell had a message of fire and brimstone for the ungodly. So the church's face to the world is an angry God, but to its own, now it's the grace of the Lord Jesus. I even see a sexual, a sexual immorality of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, as Paul says about that man with his father's wife. When I look at that bastion of moral certitude, the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, it's been in front page news now for about three decades that the church with all of its moral instruction to the world at large actually has what amounts to organized pedophile rings in their own clergy. Is, is this the city of God, the city of light? for those Gentiles to turn to, it seems in many respects that it's worse than what the Gentiles. Let me go back now to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that's Paul's given. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, I'm reading 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8, like our shorter catechism reads the Decalogue. That is, if we ever find a forbidden, it also includes a required, which, of course, is found in Paul's wider teaching. Here we have a forbidden sexual immorality inside the church. Paul is inflexible about this. The sexual anarchy that he takes for granted in the world city has no place in Jesus' city. And he actually summons the entire trinity in this passage to reinforce both his teaching and even his threats. But when we pull back and take in the required, 
We see, on the other hand, how Paul is open-handed and generous and encouraging when he lends his full support to monogamous permanent marriage. Because creational marriage is where Gentile sexuality is redeemed. Creational marriage is where Gentile sexuality is redeemed. Marriage is almost surely in this passage. When Paul says uh, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, suggests that whatever was taking place was taking place between church members, even married church members. But Paul addresses this issue clearly in many other passages. Paul lets us know that he knew Jesus' own teaching on marriage, which I think we'll consider a little bit next time. And he is, he's wonderfully and eminently practical about marriage as a, as a solution to a very human problem. Again, from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what they wrote about. Now Paul's response. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. This is a very egalitarian passage, by the way, um, probably unlike many of his contemporaries in the Gentile world. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And dropping down to the end of verse 9, it is better to marry than to burn with passion. This is Paul in the nitty-gritty of ordinary human life, even among spirit-filled believers. And he's giving to them what must seem like really the most mundane instructions about how they are to control their passions. And he has no illusions about uh, human strength of will here. He assumes it's natural weakness, but he has a solution he can provide the proper outlet. This is the church's solution to the Gentiles' bondage to its passions. This is bringing light to the matter of the darkness of sexual immorality. And it's this that puts actual Christian marriages squarely under another light, the spotlight. Because it is right here in a passage, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Thessalonians 4, that human sexuality is divinely affirmed. It is the safe and secure context for its proper expression and all the feelings that that proper expression produce. Sexual anarchy is to creational marriage what idolatry is to Christianity. It is promiscuity versus the loyalty to the one. Salvation restores human beings to their original loyalties, to God, of course, and then to one spouse. We're going to fill that out even more next time because the same Paul who has such a mundane 
nitty-gritty view of marriage. Look, if, you, if you're struggling in this area, that's okay. Just get married and do it properly. Has such a sublime view of marriage uh, that you could almost see why Roman Catholics call it a sacrament. Though I would not do that, but we'll look at that next time. So marriage itself, plain old every day, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, marriage, until old age sets in for good and one of the spouses passes away. This marriage is a witness to the watching world. It is a wordless witness, but it is a witness nonetheless to the sexual anarchy and all the trauma and pain that it causes out there in the dark city. Now at this point, to be clear, No one should hear me say that, therefore, marriages must be perfect, gloriously harmonious, free from any temptation, and completely absolved of any inner tensions. We're taking that right off the table right here. That's not how Christians are to think about. That's that, that Wesleyan intrusion of perfectionism so that the only credible witness is a perfect one, far from it. In fact, the phrase that I used last week was one woman and one man together in a happy matrimony. And I put the indefinite article in there on purpose. Together in a happy mat matrimony even if that happiness is tempered, if it's diluted somewhat by fallenness. It's a happy matrimony because it is a level of happiness that leaves both spouses relatively content. In other words, to a degree, happiness is determined by the couple what they are both content with. It is not a one-size-fits-all model. Are there one-size-fits-all instructions for marriage? Of course. But within the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions and millions and millions of marriages, these things are worked out with wisdom and humility and so forth to create a happy matrimony. Yes, there are reasons to divorce, Marriage is not a sacrament, nor are married people bound together by an inflexible, immovable canon law. But really, it's not the hard cases that concern us. It's the ordinary. And my point here is, brethren, create happiness and contentment in marriage. It's beneficial to the spouses and it's an investment, a modest investment, but a genuine investment in the church's witness in the world. It is part of the great city's light in the darkness. Create happiness and contentment in your marriages. If Paul can say, you are called to judge the angels, surely a man and a woman in Christ can work out their differences and find that common place of contentment. And what has amazed me over the years, what has absolutely astonished me, is how stubbornly arrogant a husband or a wife can be in a difficult marriage. One spouse who refuses to make even the smallest change for the sake of the other, at times, I wanted to say, come here, open your mouth, because I'm going to call down to the inside of you to see if the Holy Spirit's really in there. 
Because how can people be so stubborn and resistant and inflexible to anything that might be a benefit to their husband or wife? Miserable Christian marriage should be an oxymoron because it effectively denies Jesus' lordship over his city and over your households. And it also confirms to the Gentiles their worst fears that they will be trapped and abused in a marriage that will bring them nothing but heartache. Better to take a risk in that wider anarchy than to engage in that kind of slavery. And yet, Marriage endures. It's even cherished by those who have no faith. In the modern world, even the most sexually promiscuous Gentiles hold out hope for a marriage and the children that a marriage can produce. For some reason, they may have never even seen a successful one, and yet and I'll develop this a little bit more, there are creational hooks in all of God's image bearers, and they keep drawing people back to creational norms, even when they have no idea why that is. That's why marriage is the most natural, ordinary contact point for Gentiles and the people of God. We share it. The city of God redeems it, and it's a witness to those outside who suffer in the sexual anarchy. This is why every Christian marriage counts, why each one is worth investing in, working on, and surrendering to for the couple's own happiness and for this ever so modest investment as a witness to others. It's in the church's interest. Gentiles are not looking to us for laws. They look to us as the kingdom of God for light and for an authenticity that says this light is the true light that disperses the darkness. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you have blessed the world with marriage, but in its fallenness it has produced its own unique estate of sin and misery for countless millions, if not billions, of people throughout the ages. And yet you value it so highly, you even used marriage as a way to reveal your relationship to your people, that God is the bridegroom and his people are the bride. What a remarkable thing that is to elevate marriage to such sublime heights that we can say this about our relationship with you, for you have said it about our relationship with you. Father, we thank you for it, and we believe that in every case, as part of the light, it is under attack. Protect and preserve it and promote it among your people for our common good and for the welfare of a world that gets worn out and discouraged by their sexual anarchy. Grant us the privilege of being light taking off all covering so it's not inhibited or shaded in any way. And bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Even now as we turn to the meal that Jesus has left for us, where we give thanks for his body and for his blood, a, a, a word to be eaten, a word to be received in the innermost parts of our being, May we receive it with joy and with satisfaction, we pray. Amen.
I think by comparing Scripture with Scripture, we are free to say that in its own small way, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Certainly a foretaste of it. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The great celebration of Revelation 19 is anticipated every time the church gathers around a rickety wooden table with its pieces of bread and its little cups of juice and wine and pronounces the words of institution from the Holy Scriptures, making this meal something entirely different from all other meals, a sacramental meal. And what's so intriguing about this marriage supper of the Lamb is how Paul, in his efforts to redeem creational marriage, will go so far as to say that marriage was created at the very beginning so that the world would understand the union between Christ and his church. It's a mystery, and we'll see that in Ephesians 5, but that's part of our witness. We are telling the world about faithfulness, about endurance, about commitment, about love, in a way that reflects Christ and his church. So as we come to the table this morning, let's come, I suppose, as the wife of Christ, who provides for us, who meets our needs, who gives himself up for us in order not only to rescue us from sin, but to sanctify us and to purify us. And he reveals that work of love and salvation and sanctification whenever we come to his table. If you are not a Christian this morning, please don't come to the Lord's table, for it's the people of God who are served here by the risen Lord. But to all the rest, to all of those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and have called upon his name, come and eat and drink and receive from all of his bounty.